I think of Darwin as a reluctant uh, evolutionist. You know, he did not, um, contrary to some of the long-standing myths out there, embark upon his voyage of the Beagle um, uh, with, the, w with an interest in the origin of species. Uh, he almost came to this reluctantly, uh, as opposed to Wallace. This is one interesting contrast. As we'll see in a moment, Wallace, um, he, he embarked upon travel uh, with this firmly in mind, right, in order to, to, to say something about the origin of species. And um, ultimately what we see, one of the, you know, the, the, the key idea that we're also interested in, natural selection, is of course same, the same theory in broad strokes, but really rather different in detail and reached by different paths. And those different paths reflect something about the way in which they conceptualized natural selection. So we have the reluctant evolutionist, the eager convert. Now, of course, th you know, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about commonalities. It's well known that both drew inspiration from some of the very same sources, um, one being Charles Lyell's work, um, his classic Principles of Geology, published between 1830 and 1833, uh, the writings of the traveler naturalists like Alexander von Humboldt. And as you've just heard from, uh, from Andrew, uh, they were quite keen on beetles, um, natural history, variation, collecting, um, so we, we have some, some common elements of, of inspiration. But consider this. Um, here, this is, uh, I'm going to get into their trajectories in a little bit more detail I in a moment. But here you see a comparison where Darwin becomes uh, a transmutationist, right? The, their word, the word of the day for evolution, in 1837, some months after returning home from his voyage on the Beagle. But it's not for about another year until he discovers the mechanism behind this, uh, th this process of transmutation. Natural selection is discovered by Darwin in 1838. And then he embarks upon, famously, a long period of exploration. Uh, what I call a kind of consilience mode of, of accumulating lines of evidence um, with reference to his theory. Wallace, on the other hand, right, about 14 years while uh, Darwin's junior, um, lately comes to transmutation, uh, as you'll see, and doesn't have a mechanism doesn't have natural, he's, you know, after the, the, the solution, how indeed species change. But his path is the inverse of, uh, of Darwin's. He, he has the conviction of transmutation and pursues lines of evidence, and only lately then does he hit upon the mechanism. So here, Darwin discovers natural selection first, and then he pursues diverse lines of evidence for natural selection. Wallace, in, in contrast, pursues diverse lines of evidence, as we'll see. And this is very nicely exemplified in Wallace's species notebook that was, was alluded to, um, that I just, uh, just recently published. Um, and then finally, after uh, 10 plus years of labor, hits upon the solution. Now, one important point to make about that that I'll return to later is the idea that Darwin, of course, has the benefit of some 20 years of uh, refinement of the theory of natural selection. But the events of 1858 and 1859 are such that the idea had just barely occurred to Wallace. So, of course, he didn't have the benefit of the refinement and elaboration of the theory. And so their, their, their approaches and their understanding, their depth of understanding of natural selection was really quite different. So here, here's a thumbnail sketch just to kind of give you the, the, the sweep of activity here for, for Darwin. He's, he returns home from his voyage around the world in October of 1836. And it's not until the following March that um, through a, a variety of circumstances, including um, information on the fossils he had found in South America from Richard Owen, uh, the paleontologist and comparative anatomist, also information from John Gould, the ornithologist, about the significance of his Galapagos birds and their relationship with birds of mainland South America, he becomes convinced in March of 1837 that indeed species must change. And he begins to puzzle immediately over a mechanism. And the following year, October of 1838, hits upon this mechanism, natural selection. A few years later, he, he ventures a sketch, 1842, 1844, a very long exposition. And this, this 1844 uh, so-called species essay is really a miniature version of the origin of species. Many of the chapter headings are the same. He really has it kind of figured out in broad strokes, even at that time. But then he, you know, Darwin's so-called delay, 
you know, the, the, this period of activity pursuing lines of evidence on many fronts. He, a diversion with barnacles, um, four monographs to be exact, three different volumes on geology, the geology of the, of the Beagle voyage, um, a number of experiments, uh, uh, you know, some 60 papers and, and so on. Um, he's, he's pretty active. And finally, Charles Lyell takes notice, Charles Lyell the geologist takes notice of Wallace's so-called Sarawak Law paper that Andrew mentioned, 1855. And unlike Darwin, is, is, has a very clear sense that, that Wallace is really very close to an understanding of the, this idea of, of species change and urges his friend to consider publishing. And Darwin finally gets around to sorting out his notes and can commencing the writing up of his theory in 1856, um, underestimating Wallace's creativity. Um, in 1858, of course, famously, um, Wallace's uh, essay on natural selection, conceived in a sort of eureka moment in a malarial fit that Andrew so eloquently described, um, sends Darwin his paper and precipitates this great, this great crisis. Very quickly, the papers are read, as you all know, and then Darwin is under the gun to come out with his theory, and he, he uh, distills down the big book into the abstract, which is on the origin of species in, in 1859. So notice then, again, just to reiterate, October 1838, natural selection. All the years since, the 20 years then after that, he is refining his theory of, of natural selection. And I'm going to sort of focus in on, on that trajectory, just to sort of document that. Here again, March 1837, five months after returning home, um, as he put it in his diary that July, in July opened the first notebook on the transmutation of species. Notice what he had been struck by. Um, character of South American fossils and species on Galapagos archipelago. What he's noticing is what I think of as a species geography in space and time. He's realizing that there is an intersection, a juxtaposition of patterns of species relationship geographically as well as paleontologically in the, in the fossil record. Species change, but how, right? Once you become convinced species change, that only begins to open up questions about, about how the, the process begins. Now, how did he, you know, what was the, 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 the trend of his thinking? Well, apparently Darwin intuitively had a sense that the agricultural breeders were onto something. They're in the business of working with varieties, variations. And he poured over the agricultural breeding treatises of the day. And I want you to, to notice the language used in this particular one, which he copied out in one of his notebooks. Um, here we have um, uh, an extract, or a quote rather, from Seabright's 1809, Art of Improving Breeds of Domestic Animals. What Seabright is getting at here is the idea that you do not make new breeds just by crossing existing breeds. Notice the language that he uses. Right? You improve breeds through judicious selection. Darwin very quickly realized that you know, this process that he eventually dubbed artificial selection, selection was the key to making new varieties, making new breeds. And then the question became, that's what happens in the, uh, you know, in the, in the barnyard, in the garden. How does this happen in nature? How does this happen in the field? Right? So, Artificial selection, here's a quote from his notebook, the whole art of making varieties may be inferred from the facts stated by, by Seabright. This is where natural selection comes from. He deliberately coined that term in reference to Seabright and the word selection used by, by that breeder. And again, it wasn't for a while, the following October of 1838, as he recorded much later that he happened to be reading Malthus on population when this idea of incessant population pressure and struggle came to mind and seemed to immediately present to his mind a mechanism, a natural version of what happens in the barnyard and the, uh, and the garden, a natural version of selection. As he wrote in his autobiography, here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. And for the next 20 years, that was the guiding principle. All of the lines of evidence he pursued were always in reference to trying to see if evidence he could see, patterns he could, he could discern in nature were concordant with his theory, 
which is why, if you, as you read The Origin of Species, he's constantly presenting data, presenting patterns, and then asking the reader, now does this make more sense under a pattern of special creation or an assumption of special creation, or my theory of natural selection? Always, of course, rhetorically arguing for my theory makes the most sense. So now 20 years later, when Darwin publishes On the Origin of Species, the, the physical structure of this book reflects the trajectory of his discoveries. First of all, the domestication analogy is chapter one of the origin. He then, I have these sort of color coded, domestication in purple here. He then um, has several chapters devoted to, um, in a syllogistic way, a case for natural selection, the mechanism. And then he takes the mechanism and for the rest of the book, he runs with it. He looks for applications of the theory. So you have the analogy of domestication, the mechanism, and then applications of the mechanism to biogeography, to paleontology, to embryology, to morphology, to behavior, to hybridism, and so on and so forth, right? Um, this, is, this is an idea uh, that philosophers of the time, well, specifically William Huell, philosopher of the time, called the consilience of inductions, the idea of looking for consilient patterns are the, the, a signal amid the noise, different lines of evidence all pointing in the same direction. Huell, who coined many a, a, a term, defined the con consilience in the following way. I mean, in, in essence, as I highlight in red here, consilience, he says, is a test of the truth of the theory in which it occurs. You're looking for intersections of insights from different lines of evidence, right, consilience. Now, as I'll show you now in, in a moment, um, Wallace's trajectory was inverse. He started out in consilience mode and eventually hit upon the mechanism. And as Andrew mentioned, um, Wallace, you know, Wallace, unlike Darwin, remember Darwin, the reluctant evolutionist, almost against his expectations, comes around to an acceptance of species change. Wallace is the eager convert, something of a more revolutionary personality, a single reading of Chambers' scandalous vestiges of the natural history of creation convinces him of the truth of transmutationism. When Wallace set upon um, the, you know, launching this bold and audacious plan to travel and collect, what he was aiming to do was collect with a purpose, right? with an eye towards the question of the origin of species. You have transmutation coming first, 18... Uh, uh, 45, right? not natural selection, but the idea of evolution. Four years in Amazonia, which as we have heard, um, ended rather disastrously. And also, you know, um, uh, uh, you know among the, the specimens, the observations, the papers Wallace published, um, he, he did not solve the mystery. He hadn't satisfied himself that he, you know, he really made any progress at all in understanding species origins. And so that's probably one of several reasons why he immediately picked himself up, dusted himself off, and launched another bold expedition with the support of the Royal Geographical Society, heading this time east to the Malay Archipelago, where he spent uh, the next eight years collecting, yes, but as we'll see, and we'll see to an even greater degree in my talk this afternoon, pursuing the species question. Um, in the process, so, so Wallace is firing off paper after paper. We've heard about how Mr. Stevens is telling him, you know, um, the, you know the, the collectors, the naturalists of London are, are, are telling me they'd like to hear a little less theory from Mr. Wallace. They'd like to see more specimens from Mr. Wallace. You know, he's, he's not getting a lot of support, but he is driven by a quest to understand um, a number of things, right? He's interested in biogeography, he's interested in species relationships, he's interested in, in behavior. He fires off paper after paper, and very importantly in the history of this field, the 1855 Sarawak Law Paper may be the clearest exposition of evolution that never mentions evolution or transmutation, right? But a very clear exposition. That's 1855, a few years later, he hits it, right? Natural selection, the Ternate Paper, and as we've heard, sends this fatefully to Darwin, with whom he had been in correspondence for some time. Their papers are very promptly read, the so-called delicate arrangement of Charles Lyell and Joseph Hooker at the Linnaean on the 1st of July. Very soon after, um, and with some trepidation, Darwin writes Wallace, Hooker does as well. He's still deep in, you know, in, 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 the, in the tropics of the East. Um, he doesn't hear from them, he doesn't hear news from them until the following October. And he was delighted. 
he was delighted with, with this news. But as we'll, we'll see, um, at the same time, it must have been a bit deflating because there is evidence in Wallace's pursuit of the species question, in his species notebook, that he was actively planning to write a book on evolution, a book arguing for evolution. And he very quietly abandoned that plan with news that Mr. Darwin was working on exactly such a book. Darwin's book came out, of course, in November 1859. Darwin sent him a copy with his compliments. Wallace was still in the Malay Archipelago. Didn't receive his copy until early 1860, and of course his praise was, um, was genuine, it was warm, it was effusive. This quote you saw with Andrew's talk, the force of admiration can no further go. Delighted, happy in fact at that point to relinquish his book, get on to, to, to other things. Right? Doesn't get home until March 1862, birds of paradise in tow, and is a made naturalist. All right? So let's um, kind of talk a, a little bit about um, some details of, of uh, you know, Wallace's trend of thinking. In Wallace in pursuit of the species question. What we see, you know, th this document, this so-called species notebook, is, is the clearest exposition of the trend of Wallace's evolutionary thinking all through the 1850s. He's, he's keeping this notebook from about 1855 to at least 1860 or later, although very commonly the most interesting uh, entries end about 1859. Um, a lot of those arguments on evolution are aimed squarely at Charles Lyell. But for Wallace, um, it was really, um, you know, Lyell's book was inspiration but also provocative. Um, the second volume of the Principles of Geology was dedicated to refuting the idea that species can change. This was taken as the definitive argument against transmutation. It was the, the most definitive and damning statement on the matter. And so, it's not surprising perhaps that uh, we see Wallace in the Species Notebook framing his arguments, planning his book on the, on the subject, with reference to Lyle, where he's copying out passages from Lyle, and then he goes on to, re to um, rebut tho those arguments. The Sarawak Law Paper of 1855, right, very, very important. Um, Andrew gave you this quote as well. It is a very important one. So important to Wallace, he puts it in italics in his paper. Um, Every species has come into existence coincident in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. It's a very Lyellian argument. He's almost, he's arguing in here exactly that point that Darwin saw concerning the species of South America, the fossil record relationships between um, the Galapagos species and South American mainland species. That intersection of patterns in, in uh, biogeographically and patterns in the fossil record. Cilian's mode, pre-natural selection, has not discovered natural selection yet. For example, um, here in the conclusion, once again, he puts his law in italics. And notice his, his statements. He says that this law connects together and renders intelligible a vast number of independent and hitherto unexplained facts. What's more, this is very much consilience mode. Look at this, the natural system of arrangement of organic beings, their geographical distribution, their geological sequence, the phenomena of representative and substituted groups and all of their modifications, that's morphology, um, and the most singular peculiarities of anatomical structures, such as rudimentary organs and such, right, all are explained and illustrated by this law. This is consilience. This is lines of evidence tied together into one neat package. And we see in the Ternate essay then, so that was 1855 was consilience, 1858 is natural selection. And his approach there was really to write this paper with reference to Lyell, which is why when he sent it to Darwin, he asked Darwin if he thought it was sufficiently important, please show it to Lyell, right? If you map out this paper almost page by page, you can find not only ideas, but sometimes exact um, examples and phrases that come directly from the principles of geology, right? Uh, Lyell was squarely in mind, uh, in Wallace's mind, when he wrote the Ternate essay announcing um, his, this, this discovery of natural selection. Of course, he didn't name it. Natural selection was Darwin's term, um, which Wallace never fully liked, actually. So let's finally just talk a little bit about, about selection and their conceptions. Now, you know, the general formulation is the same. The gen in bold strokes, we're talking about variation, 
and we mean heritable variation, that's a little more implicit when it comes to Wallace, explicit with Darwin, struggle or population pressure. Wallace later said that he too, you know, kind of thought about Malthus, like Darwin did. In any case, whether or not that's true, the, uh, this idea of population pressure, struggle, differential survival and reproduction, almost sort of syllogistically gives you a dynamic, a selection dynamic, which Darwin dubbed natural selection. When we dissect that out, we see some, some differences, some similarities and differences. Darwin on natural selection, he stresses abundant individual level variation. He stresses that selection can be exerted through the environment, yes, but to Darwin, a very, very important part of his theory is selection through competition is all important, is the most important. And he had those 20 years to elaborate selection. He realized that, yeah, there's more to selection than meets the eye. He, it didn't take him long to discover the principle of sexual selection. He elaborated the theory into what we would now call a version of kin selection. It was essentially a family level selection, which he was invoking uh, in his writings to try to explain um, some of the, the peculiar morphological features and obligate sterility of social insects, like many ant species, for example. And very importantly, in, 18 in the 1850s, Darwin hit upon a principle that he thought ranked up there as important as his initial discovery of natural selection. It was a principle that he called his principle of divergence. This, is, this can't be overstated in its importance, and I you know, don't have time to really get it, do it justice in any detail. Um, it is the subject of the one and only figure, the only diagram to be found in the origin of species. It is Darwin's vision for how competition and selection act to diversify lineages, to give you a tree of life. Very, very important to Darwin, right? His, this is called the divergence of character diagram. Now, Dar uh, Wallace, on the other hand, um, really this was a one-off. You know, he came up with a theory. He's in his own accounts within a few days, wrote it out, fired it off, right? So he's not sort of, you know, elaborating. It doesn't have time to really reflect and, 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 um, and elaborate in any way. And for all that, remarkably similar then to Darwin's conception, except in this case, at least in his formulation in the Ternate paper, he stressed varieties rather than individual variation, later was criticized for that. Um, he also, really, his conception of how selection acted seemed to be more of the environmental mode, um, abiotic. Um, biotic interactions may be in the form of predation, he thought that was important, but he really didn't get into competition. The key ingredient that Darwin thought was all important was competition. Right? So he didn't, he didn't really stress competition. He certainly, as I said, did not elaborate on selection. But it's worth saying as a footnote here that Wallace, once he got home and engaged in, a, in, in an ongoing and warm dialogue with Darwin, played a very important role in getting Darwin to refine his concept of sexual selection. But of course, famously, infamously, he also broke with Darwin over the applicability of selection to human cognition. And very famously, this break in 1869 where provokes this anguished comment from Darwin in a letter, I hope you have not murdered too completely your own and my child, right? But this was not a permanent rupture, right? Their relationship was always warm and, and, and cordial. Okay, now I just wanna conclude by just kind of pointing out, so we, we see interesting similarities, some very interesting differences between Wallace and Darwin's conceptions of selection, uh, very you know, important differences in their trajectories of evolutionary thinking and discoveries of selection. Um, but I wanna point out that it is fair to say, because we are after all here celebrating Wallace, it is fair to say that in some measure, Darwin's conceptions led him astray Right? Let us not you know, be under the misapprehension that Darwin's conceptions of evolution by natural selection stood the test of time in every respect. Right? We have Darwin, for example, through his principle of divergence, emphasizing what we biologists call sympatric speciation, speciation in place, and downplaying the importance of isolation or speciation in allopatry. Right? Long since that has been, you know, that has been, I wouldn't say refuted, sympatric speciation happens, but, but almost always it's thought that isolation has, must play a role in speciation. Darwin's reliance on sympatric speciation was actually 
by and large, wrong. He's absolutely wrong. His principle of divergence is very important in the sense of underscoring important ecological principles of, for example, competitive exclusion and niche partitioning. But insofar as it led him to this model of speciation, incorrect, wrong. Increasingly, Darwin was more and more Lamarckian as the efficacy of selection came under attack. More and more, he is invoking the inheritance of acquired characters, right? all right? And he never quite defines um, species in terms that we would view as fully acceptable today, as, as fully independent reproductive entities. In many ways, it's fair to say, I think, that Wallace's view of selection and evolution is in fact closer to the modern one. Wallace always emphasized isolation, right? The primacy of isolation, allopatric over sympatric speciation. He never quite fully agreed with Darwin over that principle of divergence business, right? That's actually closer to the modern view. He consistently and explicitly rejected inheritance of acquired characteristics. He sort of argued with Darwin. When Darwin came out um, in his volumes on, on plants and animals under domestication in 1868, he presented his theory of pangenesis, which really had Lamarckian elements. Wallace disagreed with him, argued with him in letters. You know. um, consistent rejection of Lamarckism. And argued very explicitly for a concept of species that we would recognize as very much a biological species concept, or a, a concept of species as independent reproductive units. We all know, we biologists all know this is a problematic definition, but it is a kind of operational definition that we've used for quite a long time. So I just want to kind of point out here that, yes, you know, Darwin did make great strides, did elaborate the theory, had great insights, the benefit of those 20 years of refinement, but that doesn't mean, of course, that he, that, that he was exactly correct in, in every element. And remarkably, you know, the brash young man in a hurry, as Wallace called himself, happened to sort of hit it rather closer to the modern view than, than Darwin's in many cases. So um, finally, you know, none of this is to really detract, you know, from, from Darwin. Um, in fact, my, you know, in, in my view, you know, these individuals are both our first guides, and honoring one need not, should not come at the expense of the other. They were remarkably congruent in their evolutionary thinking. They came at it from different paths. That's very interesting, right? But remarkably congruent. They were together our first guides. But of course, we all recognize that Wallace has, um, his star has dimmed um, in this past century um, compared to, to Darwin's. And there are some interesting and good reasons for that. Not always um, just reasons. Um, so my, you know, in this Wallace, um, a centenary year, you know, my mantra has been, you know, let us pause and kind of reflect on the development of their evolutionary thinking and make a more conscious effort to give more credit where credit is due to the immense creativity, the tenacity, the perseverance, the insight of Alfred Russell Wallace and kind of give him the honor that I think is, is his due. Um, and in so doing, you know, not, not take away from that brilliance that, of course, is, is Darwin's as well. Um, and with that, I, I thank you very, very much for your, your attention.